The following is a production of the Pritzker Military Museum and Library. Bringing citizens and citizen soldiers together through the exploration of military history, topics, and current affairs. This is Pritzker Military Presents. Welcome to Pritzker Military Presents. I'm Ken Clark, President and CEO of the Pritzker Military Museum and Library. This program is presented in recognition of the 70th anniversary of D-Day, the June 6, 1944 invasion of Normandy that began a push by Allied forces to stop the Nazi war machine. Featured in this compilation are a number of military scholars, journalists, novelists, and service members who have been guests of the museum and library over the past 10 years, including Medal of Honor recipient Walt Ehlers, who fought with the 1st Infantry Division on Omaha Beach during the second wave of the Normandy invasion. The first segment features renowned journalist Rick Atkinson, author of the Liberation Trilogy, a narrative history of the U.S. military's role in the liberation of Europe in World War II. Atkinson is the recipient of three Pulitzer Prizes and the 2010 Pritzker Literature Award for Lifetime Achievement in Military Writing. Here, he sets the stage for our program by discussing the lead-up to the Normandy invasion and the planning involved in Operation Overlord. The Guns at Last Light opens on May 15, 1944. It opens at St. Paul's School on Hammersmith Road in London. It's there that Eisenhower, Churchill, Patton, Omar Bradley, King George VI, and several dozen of the most senior commanders of the force that's about to invade France gather to discuss for the last time the battle plan for Operation Overlord, the invasion of Normandy. They met in an auditorium known as the Model Room. It's a little like this. And they sat on hard wooden benches. In that case, it's not like this. Normally reserved for schoolboys. The poet John Milton, among other English luminaries, went to St. Paul's. And it was cold as a meat locker in the model room, and many of the generals sat with their overcoats on, even though it was the middle of May. And on the floor of the cockpit of the auditorium, there was an enormous plaster relief map, six inches to the mile, and it showed the area of France where the River Seine spills into the Atlantic Ocean at a scale of six inches to the mile. And as the plan was reviewed, a British brigadier wearing non-skid socks shuffled across the map with a pointer and pointed to different geographic locales as they were discussed in the plan on what would be, in three weeks, the most famous battlefield on Earth. And he would point to things like the beaches. So, Utah, Omaha, Gold, Juno, Sword. I found a document that explained thinking about the invasion of Normandy. And the thinking went like this. If you know that a seaborne attack into Normandy over the beaches is going to be very perilous because the Germans are there in force. And if you know that airborne attack by parachute or glider is also going to be very perilous, what are your alternatives? One alternative that was proposed is to dig a tunnel under the English Channel. And that's what this document shows. It's the result of the study that was done looking into whether or not a tunnel could be dug. And the answer was, yes, sir, we can dig a tunnel. It'll take 15,000 men a year to excavate 50,000 tons of spoil, but we can do this. What they could not figure out, what they could not finesse, was what happens when that first tunneler pokes his head up out of the hole (laughs) and the entire German 7th Army is waiting for him. So that was put on the shelf. I'm Nancy Houghton, Director of External Affairs at the Museum and Library. This next segment features retired United States Army Lieutenant Colonel and renowned military historian Carlo Deste. In 2011, Deste earned the Pritzker Literature Award for a number of incredible books, including Decision in Normandy and Warlord, A Life of Winston Churchill at War, 1874 to 1945. Here, he discusses the call from General Dwight D. Eisenhower, Supreme Allied Commander, to launch the invasion of Normandy on June 6, 1944. 
He begins with the reading of a note never delivered by General Eisenhower, where he takes full responsibility for a potential failure of the invasion. D-Day uh, was postponed for a day, a very huge decision, wrote, wrote two messages. I, I have the second message, which was never read, found yeah. two weeks later. I just want to read it. Uh, this was found by uh, his... Naval aide, Harry his Naval Butcher. Aide yeah, in it was his in his pocket. shirt pocket. They sent the shirt out for laundry, and he butcher checks the pockets like we all do and pulls out this note and kept yeah, it for I, posterity. I, found, I think this is one of the most fascinating things uh, that he ever did, but he had a second, uh, <clears throat> second statement. Our landings have failed, and I have withdrawn the troops. My decision to attack at this time and place was based on the best information available. The troops, the air, and the Navy did all that bravery could do. If any blame or fault attaches to the attempt, it is mine alone. Yeah, somebody taking responsibility for their that action. That is a How tremendous that? piece. Uh, but his decision to, to launch D-Day was, was so difficult that, that if there was nothing else that, that this guy got trained for and all the, the, the uh, experience that he had up to then and, and his growing pains in the Mediterranean, and he was not an effective commander in the beginning. He was a, he was a rookie, came in there, he made a lot of mistakes, he was tentative, uh, he grew up. And, and everybody uh, learns through experience. His experience came in the med in, in 42, 43. By 44, you got a totally different Ike. Mm-hmm. And um, come this, this do we go or do we go, because we can't hold the troops forever. You got, you got uh, thousands of, of landing craft. You've got, you've got um, over 6,000 ships that were involved in D-Day. You've got this incredible, the biggest, the biggest military force ever assembled on this planet. And, and you have to make a decision. The weather's just marginal enough, and you're relying on a weather forecast, a crude weather forecast, because weather forecasting in that time is nothing like the, the, all, the, mach- all the, the, the computers and the radar and all this stuff. And they get it often, they, they often get it wrong around here. I mean, it, I certainly do where I live. I don't know about Chicago. But they can mess it up now. Here's, here's a weather forecast. If they messed it up, the whole invasion goes down, basically gets flushed away. Uh, and if it failed, uh, the consequences, which we maybe probably don't have time to go into, but were, were horrendous. The whole course of the war would have changed. And Ike has to make a decision based on his, on his weathermen. One of the reasons he made that decision was that he and the weatherman had been working together for months. They'd been practicing scenarios. Mm-hmm. He trusted this guy. Uh, but the weathermen themselves, the, the meteorologists, were fighting among themselves, some of them saying, no, you can't. The weather isn't good enough. And, and, and finally, the, the head meteorologist, who, who uh, is a hero, he finally says, I, you know, I, I have to tell Eisenhower something. I have to make a recommendation. So he goes in and says, there's just enough of a window, because the, the big key was air. You know, you have to have a ceiling high enough so that the, the aircraft can fly. And he said, we can just make it. Uh, and the weather forecast was absolutely right on. It's just incredible. So this decision he made without hesitation. Uh, I devoted quite a bit of space to it in the book, because I, I just felt that this was his finest hour. If he never did another thing, he, the decision, his willingness to step up, to take responsibility, knowing that this whole thing could come unraveled. Uh, it, it, it was a crushing burden. And the pressure, his aides and everybody saw the pressure. He was a chain smoker. He, you know, he probably smoked five packs of cigarettes that day uh, and, and was waiting anxiously for any kind of word. They had no communications. You know, the only communications they had was that they had a phone, and it would ring, and somebody might call from from Normandy and say, "Well, we you know, we got ashore or whatever," but they had none of the 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 the, the uh, facilities, uh, the equipment, and the technology that we have today, and and so it was quite a while before they even figured out what was going on, and they were just sitting there chewing their nails, saying, "You know, did we make it?" And and finally, it became clear that they did. Um, and, and it was very interesting, the reaction, um, which I've, I've written about a little bit, uh, more so in talks that I've given. The, the reaction in America was uh, the church bells rang as, as it swept across through the night that, that the D-Day landings had taken place. The church bells rang, the Broadway show shut down, stores closed, and everyone went to church. It was just, it was just this, this amazing reaction within the American population as it went from east to west. 
uh, in Britain, it, it was very similar. The war workers all were, were just incredibly buoyed by all of this. And, and um, Englishmen or English people would stop a GI on the street and shake their hand. Next, we shift our focus to the book discussion of Operation Jedburg, D-Day and America's First Shadow War with author Colin Beaven. He discusses an operation involving 300 Allied soldiers dropping behind enemy lines to work with the French resistance and to assist in disrupting German lines of communication prior to the beach landings at Normandy. I just want to show you overall what the resistance managed to do with the help of the Jedbergs and the agents in France. So this is France right there. And you can imagine, there's that, that bit's England, and Eisenhower came across to Normandy here. Um, and there were Germans all along the coast of France, like that, and of course in Normandy too. Now Eisenhower had no choice but to face the Germans that were in Normandy. But what he wanted was that the Germans all over the rest of France to be delayed. So that all, if he didn't want to have to fight this, there were 600,000 Germans in France. He didn't want to have to fight all 600,000 at once. He just wanted to only fight these. So as soon as we launched our attack on Normandy, Hitler started to move Germans from here up, from here up, from Brittany here. So the job of the resistance and also the air forces, you know, we did a lot of bombing, um, was, to, was to slow the Germans down. The first group of Jedbergs that were dropped to organize resistance in Brittany because there were Germans all along here. And they helped... And also, when, when we finally broke out, you know, Patton sent his ta- tanks into Brittany because we needed the ports in Brittany to start bringing supplies in. So the Jedbergs and resistance there first stopped getting the, Ger- letting, stopped the Germans from getting to Normandy, and then they acted as Patton's infantry as his tanks went roaring to Brest, where the big uh, harbor was. We next join former infantry officer and West Point graduate Ed Ruggiero as he discusses the 82nd Airborne's actions on D-Day. Ruggiero is also the author of Combat Jump, the young men who led the assault into Fortress Europe, July 1943, and Duty First, a year in the life of West Point and the making of American leaders. Here, he shares the experiences of paratroopers as they are dropped into total darkness behind enemy lines to disrupt German supply lines and keep their artillery from raining down on Allied soldiers, who will soon be landing on the beaches of Normandy. In late spring, the Meridoray River moves slowly and quietly under the arched stone bridge at La Fiere. <clears throat> to the west lies a wide plain that floods with the winter rains. To the east, the road climbs a wooded hill before ambling toward the village of St. Maraglis with its ancient stone church and lovely shops crouched shoulder to shoulder around the square. On the gentle slope of a hill, 50 yards from the river's edge, stands a statue of an American paratrooper. He clutches his weapon as he peers out across the plain to the west, as if still on guard. This is the place the veterans told me about where for three days in June 1944, a few hundred American paratroopers placed themselves in the enemy's path to protect the still vulnerable invasion beaches. And it was across this picturesque bridge that their comrades counterattacked to enlarge the foothold the Allies had gained in France. I expected something grand, something larger that befit the events that took place here, but you can walk to every corner of the battlefield in about an hour, and you might not see another person. I had studied the battle from the general's point of view, but I wanted to know about the individuals who fought there. What did they see when the sun rose on June 6th? Were they still wet from being dumped on the flooded plain? Were they hungry? Were they frightened? Did they put on brave airs because they saw the men around them acting bravely? Did they pray? Those are the stories that I wanted to learn and tell. My introduction to the men of the 82nd, the World War II veterans of the 82nd, came in 1998 uh, through um, the offices of uh, Lieutenant General Retired Jack Norton. Uh, Once General Norton said that I was okay, the veterans were willing to open up to me. He gave me his blessing. And I probably interviewed 100 or so veterans in the course of writing these two books over a a period of of a couple of years. For many of these men, it was the first time they had ever talked about the war. In fact, many of the men for whom I eventually went back and signed books Their families had no idea of the extent of their involvement. They had some general notion that dad or granddad had been in the 
in the big war, but really didn't understand what all that was about. So getting to the individual stories, that was what compelled me right from the start. Those are the guys that I wanted to spend some time with, the, the foxhole point of view. So let me introduce you to some of these fellas. The first one is a, a, a fellow by the name of Roy Creek. Roy told me that his grandchildren were thrilled that his name, the first words in the book are, are Roy's name. They thought that was a big deal. So this is uh, 2.30 in the morning on June 6, 1944. Captain Roy Creek had only seconds to look around after his parachute opened. In the distance, anti-aircraft fire sparked up at the fleet of aircraft droning over the peninsula, though none had hit his plane. Nearby, he could just see the mushroom shapes of the other parachutes in the air around him. Below him was what looked like a meadow, flat and grassy with no trees to grab his chute, and more important, no obvious sign of any German defenders. This was Creek's first combat jump into enemy, and his first jump into enemy territory. So far, so good. Then he hit the water. He was immediately in over his head, the nearly 100 pounds of equipment strapped to his body, pulling him down, the tangled swamp grasses grabbing his legs. His collapsing chute floated down on him like a shroud. For Creek, who had grown up in arid New Mexico and had never learned to swim, this was a nightmare. The water closed around him. His warrior's gear pulled him down into the cold darkness. He thrashed, felt the surface with his hands. It was above his head, but not too far. The trick was, stay calm. Fighting panic, he grabbed at the knife strapped to the outside of his right boot. Thank God it hadn't come off in his flailing. He whipped it out, fighting against the tangled risers, the long, thin lines that connect parachute to body harness, and now spread over him like a net. He saw desperately at the harness, the leg strap, the belly band around his middle. In his frenzy, he cut every strap he could find, including, he later learned, the straps holding his equipment. The musette bag with his personal gear, his map case, his ammunition, his Tommy gun, tied in behind his reserve parachute, also went down in the dark. He was free of the weight, but still in danger of drowning. He kicked and flailed and by sheer luck found some purchase in the mud and the grass below him and felt the bottom rise beneath him. Finally, his head cleared the water and he sucked in cool air. Still terrified, he didn't stop fighting until he had pulled himself out and lay on a muddy bank grasping for, gasping for breath. But an infantry captain in command of a company of nearly 150 men should not be lying on the ground, lost, soaked, and unarmed. It was an inauspicious start to his war. Behind him, Creek could see his parachute floating on the surface, marking the spot where he had landed and where he suspected his weapon, ammunition, and equipment might be. He could hear movement on the bank and what might be the sounds of other men struggling in the water, but there was no one in the immediate area to help him, and he wasn't sure he would admit to losing everything, even if some GI did appear. He realized with a sickening feeling that there was nothing to do but go back into the water a second time to retrieve his equipment. In a test of sheer will, he waded in. Any misstep into an unseen hole or the river channel might be his last effort. His own parachute floating on top of the water was dangerous, a net waiting for prey. He pushed the chute out of the way and bent over quickly, thrusting his arms in front, kicking his feet to search for his tangled gear. As soon as his fingers touched the webbing, he pulled it hard toward him, then backpedaled toward the bank he had just left. Once back on dry ground, he took stock. He had his Tommy gun and the canvas case of extra magazines. Somewhere under the water nearby were his gas mask, his musette bag, containing all his rations, extra socks, raincoat, notebook, toiletries, all the items he had so carefully selected when he was packing the staging area in the staging area in England. He'd miss the equipment later, he knew, but for the moment, he was just glad to be alive. Roy Creek and a lot of the other paratroopers had landed in a flooded area, and, and most people who've read anything about the battle know now, now know that the Germans had closed the gates uh, at the Douve River where it emptied into the channel and backed up water. And an area that was supposed to be pretty much a dry plain with the Mer de Reyes, I mean, you could jump over the Mer de Reyes River if you're a 20-year-old, um, had flooded. So we're talking 500 to 1,000 yards wide of water, anywhere from 5 to 6 feet deep, and in channels 8 or 10 feet deep. One of the most amazing failures in the Allied buildup and the lead-up to uh, the invasion was the fact that nobody noticed this huge 
flooded area, which, you, as you might imagine, surprised a lot of the guys who landed in there, including General Gavin, who was not all too happy about it. And as best I can figure is that the aerial photographs of uh, taken over the invasion area, they just saw the grass. And for whatever reason, either the French resistance didn't tell anybody about the flooded zone, and the aircraft, the photographs from the aircraft, didn't pick up on it. So this was the first obstacle that the paratroopers Face the paratroopers of the 82nd. Many of them landed on the wrong side of the water, and in any case, they were split in two by this huge lake that they encountered. For Roy Creek, of course, it was much more personal. Now, General Gavin has to figure out how to get a, a mass of men together to pursue their objectives, and by the way, which side of the flooded area are the most men on. But for Roy Creek, it was much more personal than that, especially considering that he wasn't a swimmer. This, uh, this weighed heavily in his memory of the, uh, of the evening, as you might imagine. Uh, but, but the thing that, that got me about Roy Creek was that he went ahead and did his duty anyway. Around 9 o'clock on the morning of D-Day now, um, Lieutenant Colonel Edwin Osberg, who was the commander of one of the battalions in the 507th, called Roy Creek and these other officers he had gathered up and said he'd just come from General Gavin's command post with orders that they were going to cross from the west side of the flooded area to the east side. This is not great news if you're a non-swimmer like Roy Creek carrying a lot of heavy gear. Roy Creek was going back into the water for a third time. He could see the troopers, first troopers, moving out. And Creek, trying to appear confident, (laughs) trying to look as if it made perfect sense to step out into a sunlit open area that had, an hour earlier, been sprayed by German fire. He moved to the edge of the water, his boots still squishing from his earlier dunkings. He waded in, felt the cold water moving up his legs, over his waist, up to his chest. Around him, the men pushed through the water and the tangled grass. Many of them had lost equipment. Others threw away heavy gear that threatened to drown them. As they feared, the GIs were still under observation from the far bank. And they had no sooner set out than the Germans opened fire. Now, much of the shooting was from a great range and not particularly effective. But that was small comfort to men wading through the water who could hear the rounds zip by and could see a geyser every once in a while as a bullet struck close by. But incoming fire was only part of Roy Creek's concern. The water came up to his neck and then his chin. Every bit of training he'd had as an officer told him it was his job to take care of soldiers. But out in the open, where invisible holes and unseen channels threatened to drown him at any moment, he could do nothing for them except put one foot in front of the other and hope for the best. Following their general, our troopers pressed ahead, moving east toward their objectives, marching to the sound of the guns. In four years of working with and interviewing paratroopers and uh, over the course of writing two books, the thing that constantly amazed me was their willingness to do what was required and, secondly, their complete humility around that. I never met one of these fellows who, first of all, considered himself a member of the greatest generation. Only somebody who had not been there could have come up with that name. It's a great marketing uh, tool for Tom Brokaw. But none of the, the fellows who were actually there doing this thought of themselves in that vein. And the, the overwhelming answer I got in talking to any of them was, hey, you know, I was just a young kid trying to do my job and get home in one piece. And yet, when it came down to it, they were willing to do the most extraordinary things, not for, you know, President Roosevelt or mom and apple pie or, you know, why we fight or any of that thing, but almost always just because the guy next to him was watching them and was counting on them. And certainly as Roy Creek stepped out in that water, in my conversation with him, he was keenly aware that he was in imminent danger of drowning, but that the soldiers were watching him and they knew who he was. He wasn't with his soldiers. These were not soldiers from his company, but they knew he was a captain and a paratrooper and they expected him to step off. Amazingly, step off he did. Now, this was, by now we're talking about the morning of D-Day. You may know that the town of St. Mary Glees was already in the control of the 82nd uh, paratroopers by that point, but it, it didn't start out very well for the paratroopers in St. Mary Glees in the middle of the, the night before. Um, St. Mary Glees is this, uh, this little crossroads town. It was where General Ridgway and General Gavin had decided they were going to circle the wagons if the invasion fell apart. So it's critical to keep the Germans from counterattacking. It's also going to be critical if things go badly. The paratroopers are going to have a place to wait for somebody to come and rescue them, they're going to hope. 
Um, St. Mary there was a big fire in a, a house across the street from the, the church, and there's a, a, town, a square there, and the church is the main feature that they hear is probably started by a stray aircraft. What happened, there was a curfew, of course, so the French, the mayor, uh, came out, uh, the uh, Renault, and asked uh, the German commander if he could have a bucket for you. So they set up a bucket for you, the town could so to put out this fire before it spread to the other buildings, and that's where all the buildings are right. St. Marigles, they get the green light, go out of the, the aircraft door, and they can see the fire. One of these young men is a, a fellow by the name of Ken Russell. Ken was a, um, grew up on a cotton farm in Tennessee, right across the, uh, the state line from Georgia. Ken told me I'd pick so much cotton by the time I was 20 years old that I didn't buy aspirin for years because I didn't want to have to pull the cotton out of there. Ken Russell was one of the young paratroopers in, a, in an F Company stick and could see the fire. And he said, was when he saw the fires, when the first time that he became afraid, because he realized he could be pulled into the fire, which in fact happened to one of his comrades. But he jumped when it was his turn to jump. Russell looked down past his feet and saw the church below him. He pulled on the risers, hoping to slip clear of the building, but hit hard on the steep slate roof and began rolling. He was a tangle of equipment and parachute as he rolled and could not stop himself. Finally, his chute caught on the top of the roof and he came to a stop right at the edge. Russell was vaguely aware of another paratrooper, a fellow by the name of John Steele, whose parachute had caught on one corner of the tall steeple. Steele dangled helplessly while right next to him in the steeple, the bells rang loudly because of the fire. Russell was momentarily stunned, but he had a clear view of the church square only 20 feet below him. Sergeant John Ray, his squad leader, landed in the square. And just as he hit, a German soldier came around the corner of the church into Russell's view, ran up to the paratrooper, and shot Ray in the stomach at point-blank range. The sergeant fell over, clutching what would be a mortal wound. Now the German turned and looked up to where both Russell and Steele hung helplessly, easy targets, unable to fire back. Russell had just a second or two to realize the German was going to shoot him when he saw Sergeant Ray move. In his dying moment, Ray pulled his pistol from its holster and fired, hitting the German and sending him sprawling in the dust. Russell grabbed his boot knife and began frantically slashing at the thick harness, one eye on the square below, where German soldiers ran back and forth, shooting the other man in his stick. It seemed impossible that they would miss him and, and steal for much longer. Russell cleared his harness, rolled to the edge of the roof, and without hesitating, dropped 20 feet to the ground, his gear clattering around him. He grabbed his rifle and ammunition, ran to the southern edge of the square, and as he ran, he could hear the zip of bullets going by. He, the round, hear the rounds hitting the stone wall of the church. There's a, a stone obelisk there and an iron fence that he ran past, and you can still see the, the marks on the fence from the rounds hitting it. The square was all lit up. The terrified civilians had long cleared out. The Germans were frantic. Everybody's running around like crazy, and Russell used that panic to escape. He cut through an alley between two large stone houses and hugging the shadows made his way south of town. That's where he saw muzzle flashes from a heavy automatic weapon. He crept close and found, backlit by its own fire, the silhouette of an anti-aircraft gun, a self-propelled flak wagon, German anti-aircraft gun. He could see the crew working, their eyes on the sky as they fired at the Allied aircraft. Russell didn't give much thought to what he did next. He was angry at what he had just witnessed in the town square, the complete massacre of his friends. He dropped to his hands and knees, then to his belly. The sound of his movement covered by the pounding of the big gun. He crept close, holding a gammon grenade, plastic explosive. When he was within a few yards and still unseen, he hurled the grenade and then turned to move away quickly. But the blast was so powerful and he had been so close that the explosion knocked him down too. Russell jumped up and ran some distance away, then looked back to see if anyone was following him. There was no one in sight. He had killed the entire crew. Panting and sweating, Ken Russell lay in the darkness south of town, frightened, alone, and unsure of what to do next. His squad had been massacred. He had no leaders, no buddies anywhere around that he knew of. He was 17, and his war was an hour old. It occurred to Ken Russell on the ride from England that, uh, say, June 5th was a Monday. His high school class was graduating that night back in 
Tennessee. But, of course, he had lied about his age and managed to get himself into this aircraft on his way to France on the night that everybody else was going to a graduation party. You, know, you could argue whether or not that was a good idea on uh, Ken's part. He was a pretty funny guy. Amazingly, the Germans, after all of this hubbub in the middle of the square, they dropped their guard. And for whatever reason, they don't stay around. I, I can't really say they went back to bed, but in fact, in the morning, that's where a lot of the paratroopers found the Germans. They had gone back to bed. They either thought it was a raid or they thought it was some small action. They certainly weren't on their, uh, they weren't on their best game that particular night. At dawn, the paratroopers and the 3rd Battalion under command of a fellow by the name of Lieutenant Colonel Ed Krauss creep into town, led in by some French civilians, get the drop on most of the Germans, the, one who's, the ones who don't escape, uh, they capture. There was very little actual fighting going on. Ed Krauss had carried with him uh, an American flag that he was determined to put up on the city hall, the uh, Hotel de Ville in, uh, in St. Marigli's. Now, I had read this in several places, and uh, when you go to the to the city hall there, they actually have the flag. Now, you can imagine a guy's going to jump in. He's probably already carrying 100 pounds of gear. I mean, how big would the flag be that he's going to carry in there, would you think? So you, something you could put in your pocket. Nine feet by 12 feet. Huge, huge flag that he lugged in there that night. And the flagpole is right above the door. You have to go to the window on the second floor, pull down the Nazi standard. This is what the, the Germans had been using as their headquarters, uh, uh, the Kommandantur. Uh, pulled that down and, and raised the stars and stripes. After the war, uh, Ed Krause's widow donated the flag uh, to the city. And you can go to St. Marigli's now and find it at the top of these beautiful curving staircases there, the flag that he carried in. Author Patrick O'Donnell visited the museum and library in 2012 to discuss his book, Dog Company, The Boys of Point du Hoc, the rangers who accomplished D-Day's toughest mission and led the way across Europe. 68 soldiers from Dog Company, 2nd Ranger Battalion, stormed the cliffs of Pointe de Hoc amid a hail of machine gun fire and hand grenades in an effort to eliminate German artillery. 7.45 a.m. on June 6, 1944. This is where Force A, 225 Rangers, were headed towards Pointe de Hoc. And Pointe de Hoc, for those of you that don't know, is a rocky peninsula that juts out between Omaha Beach and Utah Beach. The reason why anybody cared about it was in World War II, there were six big guns, mighty guns, that could threaten Omaha Beach or Utah Beach. Point to Hawk had to be neutralized at all costs. They threw nearly a thousand bombers at Point to Hawk. Seven, over 1,000 tons of bombs were dropped on Point to Hawk. 500 tons were dropped on D-Day alone. Nothing destroyed those guns but two men, two men that were in dog company. And that's the story that I'm going to tell tonight. That At 6.45 in the morning, <clears throat> a young naval lieutenant from the Royal Navy was guiding roughly 10 landing craft that were born, they, were, they thought were bond, uh, bound for Pointe de Hoc, when in reality they were bound for a place called Pointe de la Passe, which was on the other side of Omaha Beach. It was a navigation error. The radar that this young lieutenant had was not working properly. They were going in the wrong direction. As they got toward, towards the cliffs of Pointe de la Passe, they realized that this was C Company's objective of the 2nd Ranger Battalion and not Pointe de Hoc. And Colonel Rudder demanded that this young lieutenant change course. This error basically changed the entire course of history. It's a very strange, auspicious, auspicious chain of events that, that occurred. This, the entire timetable was altered at this point. As, the, as they changed course, they were roughly 30 minutes behind schedule. As they got closer to Point to Hawk, the bombers that were supposed to bomb Point to Hawk at 6.30 bombed a little bit late. Had the men been on time, they would have all probably been dead. Luckily, they landed about 6.09 in the morning at the right place, but the follow-on force, there was roughly a 1,000 men allocated for Point to Hawk. This included the entire 2nd Ranger Battalion as well as the 5th Ranger Battalion. The 5th Ranger Battalion's secondary objective was Omaha Beach. At this time, Omaha Beach was bogged down. Dog Green was suffering enormous casualties. If you've seen the movie Saving Private Ryan, this is, this is Dog Green Beach. Part of the 2nd Ranger Battalion lands here. What happens next is that Rudder tries to radio the 5th and tell them that they're, they're bound for Point to Hawk. None of the radios work 
for some mysterious reason. The men of the 5th Ranger Battalion, as well as secondary elements of the 2nd Ranger Battalion, head to their second objective, which is Omaha Beach. They land in Omaha Beach, and they land next to Dog Green, the, the beach that's the, the toughest contested beach, and they lead the breakout. An entire battalion of rangers, the 5th, is landed at exactly the right place at the right time, and they help save the beachhead at that point. Then, this is where our story comes into play. Dog Company, as well as E and F companies of the 2nd Ranger Battalion, assault the cliffs of Point de Hoc. This is one of the incredible stories of World War II. They climb a 90-foot cliff under direct enemy fire. This, for the first time in the English language, I have the oral histories from German veterans that were on top of Point de Hoc that are firing MG-42 machine guns. They're firing belt after belt of rounds. The barrels on the MG-42s actually get red hot, and they begin to warp. They have to change the barrels. They, they send so many rounds through the, the barrels on these Rangers as they come off the landing craft. Many men are hit, including the main character of Dog Company, Leonard Lamell, who's the first, sar- first sergeant of Dog Company. As they, they disembark from the craft, massive shell holes are in front of the, the landing craft, and they go into a pool of water over their head. They somehow swim out, and they start to climb the cliffs. The ropes are slick. They're, they're barely able to, to hang on as they climb. The Germans are, are throwing mat- potato masher grenades down on them. They're firing the men's scale. As one man s- f- uh, slides down the rope, another takes his place. They move up the cliff. It wasn't even the hardest part. What most people don't realize is that, that the top of Point to Hawk was a virtual fortress. There were a labyrinth of tunnels, bunkers, 37-millimeter anti-aircraft guns, 20-millimeter anti-aircraft guns, 88s, mortars. These men were going through hell. They had to fight through the top of Point to Hawk, and the Germans were ready. They had 30 minutes uh, after the bombardment, and they were ready for the, the Rangers as they, as they fought through this maze. Lamel and Dog Company have the largest group on top of Point to Hawk. He organizes it. They move through these gun casements where they, th- they, f- they find that the, the large guns that are on top of the point are telephone poles. The Germans had realized that the aerial bombardment had targeted Point de Hoc, so they moved the guns 800 yards inland. Lamel fights through this position, takes out a machine gun nest in a bunker, and they find a, a country road, and they see some tire tracks, and they realize that this is probably the guns and he moves down the, 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 this old country road. They go through, they f- have a several firefights near a barn, and as they work down the road, they decide to split up in groups of two to, twos to find the guns. The guns are the number one objective. Their secondary objective is to cut the road that, that, that runs across the top of Point to Hawk that connects Omaha Beach with Utah Beach. But their number one objective is to find these guns. Because if the guns are not taken out, they could potentially change the course of the invasion. He and Jack Kuhn, who's his, one of his best friends as a staff sergeant, works their way down this country road, and they find an apple orchard, and they say, oh, my God, there they are. There's five guns that are, that are completely ready to fire on Utah Beach. The ammunition is nearby. And then remarkably, nearly 120 Germans are standing in formation ready to man the guns. At this point, he, he pulls out a thermite grenade and asks, and asks Jack for his, and they start, he, Lamel begins to uncork this thermite grenade on the gears of the guns, immobilizing them. He doesn't have enough. The, the thermite grenade, for those of the, you that don't know, burns at a very high rate of temperature, about 1,200 degrees, and creates kind of a molten metal and it, it basically froze the gears and the guns. Lamel then took his Tommy gun and, and smashed the sights of the guns to render them inoperable so they couldn't be targeted on the beaches. He then went back to his friend, and they found the other members of Dog Company, and they asked for any other th- remaining thermite grenades that they had, and they disabled the other three guns. And at this point, he sends word back to Colonel Rudder that the guns had bis- been disabled, and they move towards their secondary objective, which is to cut the road 
that, that connects Utah Beach and Omaha Beach. They set up a roadblock along with other members of Easy Company and F Company. They form an L-shaped line. And this is really one of the untold stories of Point to Hawk. It was, the guns were one point, but then the Germans relentlessly counterattacked. It began roughly around midnight that they, they came in mass. They were counterattacking in small groups up until that point, but then they came in mass, and it was they came in in 200 to 300 man strength. And this is these are troops that were diverted from Omaha Beach where they needed to be, and they were then attacking Point to Hawk in strength. They're attacking this L-shaped line, and the, the the apex of the battle is at sort of this angle in the L-shaped line, and Dog Company is there with machine gunners, and they took the German MG42s because they didn't have enough um, 30 caliber machine guns. They didn't have enough ammunition. They also took um, potato masher grenades, and they armed themselves with these weapons. And the, the, the book has several accounts from German soldiers that are stunned to realize, oh, my God, the armies, the Americans have our MGs. They realize that the, the best weapon of the war, the MG-42, is being turned against them. They fire into the German ranks. The Germans have this interesting sort of psychological warfare that they're, that they're, that's going on. They start calling out German names, Franz, Schmidt, etc., to sort of psych out a little bit of a roll call to psych out the Rangers. They, they charge. The first charge fails. The second charge takes out part of the angle. And the third charge overwhelms most of the line. Dog Company holds. They're in a small hedge row off to the side. But Easy Company and F Company falls back. An entire platoon is captured by the Germans and is, is taken out. Um, and as, as the battle fall, uh, swings back and forth, um, Dog Company holds its position on this L-shaped line. And, and, and it prevents the Germans from going down the road, but the Germans sweep closer to Point de Hoc. And at this point, one of the commando observers who trained the Rangers, a, a, a gentleman by the name of Colonel Trevers, he's a very interesting character. He's a, he was commander of the first number one commando in, in the British Army, and he trained the men on how to, how to climb cliffs. But he also had this bizarre sort of way of avoiding bullets. He would step to the side one way and step to the side another way and hope to somehow avoid German bullets. And he taught these guys that this was this little stutter step of his was a way to avoid bullets. And then on D-Day, he att- attempted to do that on the beach near Point de Hawk, and his, a German drilled a bullet straight through the top of his head. It was right through the, the top of the liner. It grazed the top of his head and... Luckily, he wasn't very severely wounded, but he, he provided some very interesting insight on how how how, um, how how bad the battle was. When Colonel Rudder asked him, "What do you think is going to happen?" he said to him, I, "I don't think in my entire life that I've ever felt this way that it would feel that we're going to either be captured or killed tonight." That's how tough the battle of Point Hawk was, and it, it kept going that way until the eighth of June when the 5th Ranger Battalion, um, along with elements of the 29th Division, came in from, come up from Omaha Beach and relieved the point. Medal of Honor recipient Walter Ehlers twice visited the museum and library to share his story of service on Omaha Beach, where he served as a squad leader in charge of 12 soldiers with the 1st Infantry Division, known as the Big Red One. He discussed the intensity of the fighting and how he and all of his men made it off the beach alive through a wall of bullets and sniper fire. His older brother Roland also participated in the D-Day invasion and unfortunately did not survive. When I, I landed on the beach and I saw a beach master there and I asked him what direction we go from here and he said, well, you just follow that path there and uh, uh, if you go to right or left of it, you'd be stepping on mines. Well, we could see why the path was there because there were guys dead on both sides of the path and mm. guys that had been wounded and so forth. And we got up to the last row of wire that hadn't been blown yet, and two Bangalore torpedo men were pinned down in the draw, kind of a deflated area, you know. And uh, every time they'd move, they'd sniper fire at them. 
So I told them if they'd blow the wire for us, we'd lay down a field of fire up there and try to keep the sniper pinned down. Mm -hmm. So we did, but we didn't really know where the sniper was. And uh, sure enough, uh, as we're laying down the fire, they got up to move, and uh, the one guy got killed, but the other one got the Bangalore torpedo into the wire, and, mm -hmm. and he set it off. And as soon as it breached the wire, I rushed my squad through it. And on the other side, there apparently wasn't any mines because we went right up the hill into the trenches there. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we captured four guys and sent them back down to be interrogated, and then uh, the rest of them we either killed or they escaped from us. Mm -hmm. we, but we got the pillbox from the rear. And uh, that was, uh, there were three pillboxes there, and I don't know, I, you know, when we were going up there, we saw guys who were carrying satchel charges on a big pole, pole charges, some people call them. But anyway, they're, uh, they're a charge on the end of the pole, and they put this into the uh, breach of the pillbox to try to blow, not blow the pillbox up, but to kill the people inside or whatever it might do. And uh, all three of them got killed before they even got there. Uh, we weren't prepared for the chaos that we saw on the beach when we got there. The first thing is that when we're uh, out there in the water, we see all these ships firing, you know, rockets and everything else out there towards the beaches. And, of course, before that, we heard the bombs landing. And we figured that that beach should be pretty well neutralized, you know, but uh, that didn't happen. There wasn't any uh, shell craters. There were no bomb craters. There were no... Uh, pillboxes knocked out or anything like that and the men were all up in the trenches there and the, a German division was in full gear uh, pulling an anti invasion maneuver and the, they met up with the real thing but mm -hmm. they were prepared for us and uh, they had all these areas of their places these pillboxes had all the areas zeroed in where they would be firing the guns and things like that mm -hmm. and we were in a tremendous crossfire from uh, uh, the Omaha Beach was about six miles away, and from down at the other end was a pillbox, and down at the other the, the other side was a pillbox. They had a crossfire. Then we had numerous pillboxes right in front of where we landed on Easy Red. There were three pillboxes. There's one up high on the hill, one run lower part, and then one across the valley, uh, the draw right up on the hill there. Mm. And on top of that, there was a machine gun nest up there that was killing off our GIs like they were going out of style. And it's, uh, yeah, yeah. We uh, had a chance to meet that German a machine mm -hmm. gunner. He did survive the war. And he said he was, he was uh, shooting his machine gun and he was cry crying at the same time because he had, uh, was <clears throat> killing so many men. And uh, it was kind of, you know, revealing to... Uh, know that they had some feelings too, you know. They, yeah. they, they were just like us. They were supposed to be fighting for their country. And uh, of course, I talked to little kids, you know, and things like this. One time, a little girl asked me, she says, Well, how many people did you kill? I said, Honey, I didn't kill any people. Uh, I wasn't trained to kill people, I was trained to kill the enemy. And I said, mm -hmm. If I hadn't killed them, I wouldn't be here talking to you. Yeah. That's uh, the way it was there. And uh, that's. What those people were doing, they're trying to kill us, and we're trying to kill them. After I landed on the beach, I was supposed to take a patrol into the city of Trivieres. We, we had expected that the Which is how first far. wave would have the beach secured, but uh -huh. it wasn't secured at all. And uh, was, so we had to fight our way off of it. And uh, needless to say, we were fighting the Germans from hedgerow to hedgerow uh -huh. the first day. I did take my squad to Trivieres, though, but I got shot at, and... The bullet went across my helmet, and mm. <laughs> I was down in a draw, and we were on a reconnaissance patrol, so we weren't supposed to be getting into a firefight, but mm. uh, uh, I fired back out automatically, and then I dropped back down in the draw that we were starting to come out of, and I mm. looked down at my gun, and the thing had jammed. It, the bullet was still back, and the, another bullet was caught the one in the chamber, so I had to get out my <laughs> trench tool and take out mm. the the uh, shell out of the chamber and, and reload and so forth. But uh, that scared me more than anything, mm -hmm. I think, because I thought if I'd have had to fire another shot, I would have never made it. <laughs> I would, I, I would yeah. like to, to just ask you yeah. to kind of reflect at the end of that day, what was your 
thinking. Now, Roland was down the beach 100 yards, and you didn't hear from him, and you inquired about him. Well, they hadn't landed yet because I was up in the trenches already when the second wave came in. And uh, and I knew that they were getting fired upon, but I didn't know how bad or anything like this. And there was all kinds of boats on the beach. And, I mean, it was uh, becoming a, you know, saturated with boats and men and equipment and things like that. And there was no way I could go back and look for him. And, and but we had a pack anyway that uh, if one of us fell, uh, as long as we're in combat and we have to be, be fighting, we weren't going to stop and take care of the other mm-hmm. one because uh, otherwise we would lose the effect of uh, our advance, you know, to making uh, keep on going. It mm-hmm. wouldn't get anywhere if we all stopped and helped one another. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we had to keep going. The uh, next day I met his uh, platoon sergeant. Uh, from K Company, he came across our path in there. I asked him uh, if he knew where my brother was, and he just told me he was missing in action. Yeah. I, I figured that he either was wounded or killed. I didn't, I didn't know. In the next segment, English historian Sir Max Hastings describes the actions of Company Sergeant Major Stan Hollis, the only recipient of Britain's Victoria Cross for valorous actions on D-Day. Hastings is the 2012 Pritzker Literature Award winner and author of 23 books, including Inferno, The World at War, 1939-1945, to and Arbengeden, The Battle for Germany, 1944-1945. to One of my favorite stories of the Brits was of um, a company sergeant major called Hollis, who won the Victoria Cross in Normandy. And Stan Hollis, um, three times on and after D-Day, single-handed, attack German positions, that his company commander would say, Sar Major, um, you see that German position up there holding up the advance? And Hollis would say, um, yes, sir, and pick up a few grenades and a sting gun and charge them and capture them. And unlike most people who did things like that, he survived the war and um, he lived to keep um, a pub in Yorkshire in his old age. Um, when I was writing Overlord, I interviewed his colonel. And his colonel said, you know, he said, I think in the whole war, Hollis was the only man I met who felt that winning it was his personal responsibility. (laughs) Um, He said everybody else, um, when there was some ghastly job to be done, um, they'd feel, well, please God, some other city bugger can be found to do it. And every army needs a few people like Hollis in order to do the business. We conclude our program with a discussion by Anthony Beaver, author of The Second World War. He describes a Korean man and his unique path to involvement in the D-Day campaign with an emphasis on the effect of world war on civilian life. A former regular officer in the 11th Hussars in Germany, Beaver is also the award-winning author of Crete, the Battle and the Resistance. Today, it's very hard to appreciate the huge historical forces which killed some 60 to 70 million people. When we dwell on the enormity of the Second World War and its victims, we try to absorb all those statistics of national and ethnic tragedy. But this also makes us overlook the way that the Second World War changed even the lives of survivors in ways impossible to predict. In June 1944, a young soldier of Far Eastern appearance surrendered to American paratroopers in the Allied invasion of Normandy. At first, his captors thought that he was Japanese, but he was in fact Korean, and his name was Yang Jong. In 1938, at the age of 18, Yang had been forcibly conscripted into the Japanese uh, Kwantung Army in Manchuria. A year later, he was captured by the Red Army after the Battle of Kalkin Gol and sent to a labor camp. The Soviet military authorities, at a moment of crisis in 1942, drafted him, along with thousands of other prisoners, into their forces. And then early in 1943, he was taken prisoner at the Battle of Kharkov in Ukraine by the German army. In 1944, now in German uniform, he was sent to France to serve with an East Battalion on Ostbataillon at the base of the Cotton Town Peninsula inland from Utah Beach. After time in being, after being captured and after time in a prison camp in Britain, he was transferred uh, to another one in the United States. And when released at the end of the war, he settled here. Yang finally died in Illinois in 1992. 
In a war which killed so many millions of people and had stretched around the globe, this reluctant veteran of the Japanese, Soviet and German armies had been comparatively fortunate. Yet Yang remains perhaps the most striking illustration of the helplessness of ordinary mortals in the face of what appeared to be overwhelming historical forces. In this special D-Day anniversary edition of Pritzker Military Presents, you've seen highlights from our previous programs about the invasion of Normandy on June 6, 1944. You can learn more from these authors, scholars, and service members by visiting us online or by borrowing their books and publications from our collection. To download audio podcasts, view additional content, become a member, and explore all that the museum and library has to offer, visit us in person or online at pritzkermilitary.org. Thanks for watching, and please join us next time on Pritzker Military Presents. Pritzker Military Presents is made possible by members of the Pritzker Military Museum and Library and its sponsors. The views and opinions expressed in this program are not necessarily those of the museum and library. If you would like to be a part of our studio audience, become a member, or learn more, visit PritzkerMilitary.org. The preceding program was produced by the Pritzker Military Museum and Library.